<clears throat> Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Casual Audio Papers. Uh, today we're going to be looking at, by Goswami, Neuroscience and Education, From Research to Practice. And this is actually, uh, this paper, or this uh, page, has two papers on it that we'll go into. Neuroscience and Education from Research to Practice. And then there is this one down here. <laughs> cool. Uh, this one, Cognitive Neuroscience and Education, Unraveling the Confusion. Again, all public access, you can go look this up at what this, what was this one? Here we go. TheLearningSciences.com and go to Bundle Collection and then in Bundles, Mind, Brain, Health and Education. And we're down here at Goswami from 2006. Oh, I wanted to amend one of my comments, I think from the last episode or an episode before that, when I was talking about the book Biased. <clears throat> so the book is by Jennifer L. Eberhardt, PhD. And like I said, it's not bad, it's just... She definitely comes at it from a particular political bent. And so the book is about just implicit bias, explicit bias, how it affects people, um, systemic racism, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but it, it comes at it like you have to pretty much believe what she believes before you take the research to mean what she says it means. And I'll give you an example just at the end of chapter two. It says, last couple paragraphs, is clutching your purse when you see a black man a reflection of prejudice? Is presuming a Latino doesn't speak English logical or ignorant? Is it bias speaking when you ask a young black woman who was just admitted to Harvard whether, quote, that's the one in Massachusetts, end quote, which I don't really get that. Like, how is, how is that bias? Like, she doesn't know where Massachusetts is or where Harvard is? I don't know. Or when you compliment an Asian student on those high, on, on those high math scores, when you think a teenager's music is louder than it is, is that bias? What about asking for a different nurse because yours has tattoos? How do we know when we are being insensitive or unfair? How much of who we are and how we feel is dictated by things outside our awareness or control? How often do we really, uh, how often are we really the tolerant, fair-minded person we want to be? And how can we learn to check ourselves and mute the negative impact that bias can have? Basically, I didn't, I wasn't aware some of these were biases. I mean, I understand the clutching your purse one because I've heard that one before. Um, and presuming a Latino doesn't speak English. I suppose I can see that. Like you go up to somebody who is speaking Spanish and they're Latino and you're like, do you speak English? And then, you know, if they say yeah, then yeah. If they say no, then no. You know, or whatever. But I don't get I don't get some of those other ones. Basically, you have to assume that all of those are biases. First of all, and second of all, you have to assume that biases and heuristics are wrong or are bad. Another example from the the book uh, it talks about uh, what was it called? Uh, repetition inhibition where you see a oh 
you see a face, let's say it's a white face, and your brain activates a lot more. And she interpreted that to mean that when you see a white face, you recognize it, you want to um, associate with it and, act, and, and participate in activities in it, with, with it. Uh, you basically are recognizing it as an in-group face. When you see a black face, you don't, you you aren't paying as much attention to it. You uh, basically, it, you can show the same person a multitude of black faces, and they don't pay attention to the details of the differences between the black faces. Her interpretation of that is all black faces are basically the same because they're all part of the out group. But then when you uh, when you activate repetition inhibition, which is when you see white faces over and over and over again, eventually your brain sort of goes to the same level of activity that it would when when it's uh, when it sees a black face. And then she says, therefore, you've become familiar with with white faces and you have fully integrated them into your own uh, friend group or whatever into your familiarity. And so. It's one of those things where, OK, the data is there, but the interpretation of the data is highly subjective, which is actually one of the previous episodes when we were talking about um, the neuroscience and how that affects education. The big question is, are we learning about education from neuroscience or are we interpreting the neuroscience through education? Like what direction is the interpretation going? And so the same thing is happening here. When you're talking about bias and when you're talking about neuroscience, uh, is the neuroscience informing our understanding of bias or is our understanding of bias informing the data in the neuroscience or, or both? Like it could be um, quad, uh, bilateral in that sense. But that's something that we have to be really careful of. And the previous paper that I, I went over was really helping to sort of center us within that question. We have to make sure that what we're studying is actually what we're studying and our, our own biases are not informing what we're studying so that we, we ourselves are, are participating in uh, confirmation bias when we are doing these studies. But I think what I remember when I said that the book is a decent book, I was remembering more the research I did because of the book. Because when you look at one thing or another, the inhibition um, or the repetition inhibition, for instance, when you look a bit more deeper into that, it actually has a wide range of interpretations that you might be able to use. It's just she uses her interpretation and that sort of thing. But all of it is really interesting, and I recommend, I don't know if I recommend reading it, but it's at least a good starting point where you can read it and think critically, ask the questions about what she brings up, and really see, really see what the science says. Another thing she brings up in that second chapter, which I was just rereading, is the idea that kids show the same implicit biases that their parents show explicitly, sort of assuming that implicit bias is much more of a stable uh, measure. But we also saw with the previous paper that it's not a stable measure. And so another thing that we just have to bear in mind is Bias is actually a relatively new thing that people are studying. And we really don't know much about it. So let's get to this paper. Neuroscience and Education from Research to Practice by Science and Society. Uh, I think, let's see actually, what's the journal here? Nature, Nature Reviews, Neuroscience, okay by Usha Goswami. Abstract. Cognitive neuroscience is making rapid strides in areas highly relevant to education. 
However, there is a gulf between current science and direct classroom applications. Most scientists would argue that filling the gulf is premature. Nevertheless, at present, teachers are at the receiving end of numerous brain-based learning packages. Some of these contain alarming amounts of misinformation. Yet such packages are being used in many schools. What, if anything, can neuroscientists do to help good neuroscience into education? And that's one of the big things is neuroscience, we don't know much about it. Oh, like Obama was right when he was saying that he wanted to advance brain, um, just the study of the brain and everything. But we don't know much about it, even still. So... We, we just have to walk tentatively when we talk about neuroscience and its applications. And there are lots of um, what Tracy Dogama Espinoza says are neuromyths. And that's just, you know, we, we believe a lot of things that may be true broadly or statistically or may not be true, but they're just popular neuroscience myths. And we have to be sure that we are uh, thinking critically about them. Okay, let's get into this. There is a hunger in schools for information about the brain. Teachers are keen to reap the benefits of the century of neuroscience for their students. In, in neuroscience laboratories, considerable progress is being made in understanding the neurocognitive development and underpinning essential skills taught by educators, such as numeracy and literacy. This progress is largely theoretical. The current gulf between neuroscience and education is being filled by packages and programs claiming to be based on brain science. The speed with which such packages have gained widespread currency in schools is astonishing. This article highlights some pervasive neuromyths that have taken root in education, gives a flavor of the information being presented to teachers as neuroscientific fact, and reviews recent findings in neuroscience that could be relevant to education. It also considers what, if anything, we should do now to influence the, the widespread misapplication of science to education. Brain-Based Learning in Schools At a recent conference held to mark the launch of the Center for Neuroscience and Education at the University of Cambridge, teachers reported receiving more than 70 mail shots a year, encouraging them to attend courses on brain-based learning. Similar phenomena have been reported in other countries. These courses suggest, for example, that children should be identified as either left-brained or right-brained learners because individuals prefer one type of processing. Teachers are told that the left brain dominates in the processing of language, logic, mathematics, form, mathematical formulae, numbers, sequence, linearity, analysis, and unrelated uh, factual information. Meanwhile, the, the right brain is said to dominate in the processing of forms and patterns, spatial manipulation, rhythm, images, and pictures, daydreaming, and relationships in learning. Teachers are advised to ensure that their classroom practice is automatically left and right brain balanced to avoid a mismatch between learner preference and learning experience. This neuromyth probably stems from an over-literal interpretation of hemispheric speculation. Other courses for teachers advise that children's learning styles should be identified as either visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, and that children should then wear a badge labeling either V, A, or K while in school, showing their learning style for the benefit of all of their teachers. Still, others argue that adoption of a commercial package, Brain Gym, ensures that true education happens. Brain Gym prescribes a series of simple body movements to integrate all areas of the brain to enhance learning. Teachers are told that, in technical terms, information is received by the brainstem as an impress, but may be inaccessible to the front brain as an express. This locks the students into a failure syndrome. Whole brain learning draws out the potential locked in the body and enables students to access those areas of the brain previously unavail unavailable to them. 
improvements in learning are often immediate, end quote. It is even claimed that the child can press certain brain buttons under their ribs to focus the visual systems for reading and writing. Many in education accept claims that these, that, uh, such as these as established fact. Scientists have already alerted society to the neuromyths that are dominant in education at present. In addition to the left brain, right brain learning myth, Neuromyths that relate to critical periods for learning and to uh, synaptogenesis can be identified. The critical period myth suggests that the child's brain will not work properly if it does not receive the right amount of stimulation at the right time. An insightful analysis is provided by Burns. Direct teaching of certain skills must occur during the critical period or the window of opportunity to educate will be missed. The synaptogenesis myth promotes the idea that more will be learned if teaching it is timed with periods of synaptogenesis. Educational interventions will be more effective if teachers ensure that they coincide with increases in synapsis density. Educational interventions are, are also sometimes suggested to be superior if they encourage neuroplasticity, and teachers are told that neural networks can be altered by neuroplasticity training programs. Teachers do not realize that, although there might be sensitive periods for some forms of learning, the effects of any type of training program that changes behavior will be reflected in the remapping of neural networks. Um, the idea of neuroplasticity is that all learning is neuroplasticity because learning happens in the brain and therefore the brain is changing. Neuroplasticity just means the brain is malleable. And there are certain extreme uh, instances where that happens and definitely like infants have have much more neuroplastic pot potential um it's not like there are critical areas where you'll learn math for instance or, or critical instances the there are i think i think there's only two things that are particularly important and that's visual representations of how shapes interact with uh, physics and how colors interact with shapes. And there is language. Like if you don't learn language or that other thing at a young enough age, then you may never learn it uh, on a, at a sufficient level as, say, an adult who has learned it at that age. Neuroscience in the classroom. These neuromyths need to be eliminated. The dominance of these myths obscures the important strides being made by cognitive neuroscience in many areas relevant to education. For example, our understanding of the neural basis of the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, that's, yeah, yeah, okay, is growing rapidly. So is our understanding of how to optimize the brain's ability to benefit from teaching. Good instructional practice can be undermined by brain-based factors such as learning anxiety, attention deficits, and poor recognition of social cues. All of these factors disrupt an individual's capacity to learn and also have an effect on other learners in the same classroom. Reading and dyslexia. From work with adults, it is well established that a left hemisphere network of frontal, tempor uh, temporal, parietal, and, occipital, uh, and occip occipital temporal regions underpins mature reading. However, cross-language imaging studies show some interesting variations. These seem to depend on how the orthography, the writing system, of a language represents phonology, the sounds of the language. When, le when learners of transparent writing systems, for example, Italian, are contrasted with learners of non-transparent, for example, English, or character-based, for example, Chinese writing systems, highly similar brain areas are found to be active during reading. However, mature readers of transparent orthographies show greater activity in the left planum temporal, a brain region involved in letter sound conversion. Whereas mature English readers show greater activation of an area known as the, vis uh, the visual word form area in the left occipital temporal region. 
Although originally proposed as the substrate of visual word recognition, this neural area has also been proposed to involve phonology. For example, through the computation of orthographic phon phonological connections, its greater activation in English could reflect the several levels of spelling sound correspondence that are important for de decoding English. For example, reading BOMIC by letter sound conversion or by analogy to comic. Readers of Chinese show relatively more engagement of visuospatial uh, areas, presumably for recognizing complex characters. Okay, so this shows us young readers versus adult readers in their reading acquisition. So And then the neurobiological basis of dyslexia. That is, typical readers involve a lot more um, areas of their brain. Well, what, what were these called again? The uh, temporal parietal and occipital temporal regions. So occipital temporal here and the temporal parietal is right there. And then, of course, that's the frontal. And then dyslexic readers only have, it seems, the frontal here, and they're missing this area and this area. OK. Developmentally, it is known from behavioral studies that pre-readers who can recognize phonological similarities, for example, that cat and hat rhyme, or that cat and cup share the first sound, become better readers. Imaging studies have confirmed that young readers primarily depend on the left posterior superior temporal cortex. Tem uh, that young readers primarily depend on the left posterior superior temporal uh, cortex. Right there. The left posterior posterior superior temporal cortex. And that's the temporal cortex. The area identified in adult studies as the locus of phonological decoding. Activity in this region is also modulated by children's phonological skills. As literacy is acquired, the what was that visual word form area described as a skill zone by some developmental neuroscientists is more engaged and areas initially active in the right hemisphere are disengaged. Really interesting thing about that um, I did a research paper on the difference between how people interact with humor and words if the um, language reads from left to right versus right to left. And of course, I didn't find anything because, well, first of all, that there's not a lot on that, but also <laughs> there isn't a lot in general um, that would be there. It's a very acute research topic but um in one of the studies they were studying hebrew and because it reads from right to left and a really interesting thing that they found was because hebrew doesn't actually have vowels what well, it can and it, and it doesn't have to so the vowels are built within or around the, the con consonantal letters and so when you read it using the vowels the visual word form area is a lot more activated and centralized and when you're reading it without the vowels you are uh, using a much more um, holistic let's say a holistic contextual region of your brain which I forgot exactly um, what area that was but the visual word form area is still partially activated but uh, to a less degree than it would normally Studies of children with developmental dyslexia, children who are failing to learn to read normally despite average intelligence and educational opportunities, show that atypically the right temporal parietal cortex continues to be activated during reading. Children with developmental dyslexia also show significantly less activation in the usual left hemisphere 
sites. If targeted rem remediation is provided, usually through intensive tu um, tuition, it, intensive tuition in phonological skills and in letter sound conversion, activity in the left temporal and parietal areas appears to, to normalize. So far, however, de developmental neuroimaging studies have been short uh, term and mostly confined to English. Theoretically motivated studies across languages are now required. These developmental imaging studies show that we can begin to pinpoint the, the neural systems responsible for the acquisition of reading skills and that we can remediate inefficiencies in these systems. However, so far these studies do not tell teachers what works in the classroom. Most training studies have used interventions already known to be successful from educational research and have simply documented that neural changes in the, in the expected areas accompany behavioral changes. So far, neuroimaging tells us little more, but the potential is there. For example, imaging offers the possibility of identifying neural indices of a child's, of a child's potential difficulties which may be hidden from view early in development. We can attempt to identify neural markers for phonological sensitivity, such as brain responses to auditory cues for rhythm, to identify who is at risk of later reading difficulties. Alternatively, we can see general language markers for dyslexia. In both cases, early identification of infants with poor skills would enable language interventions to prevent dyslexia long before schooling. Studies could also be designed to test neural hypotheses. For example, a popular cognitive theory of developmental dyslexia proposes a cerebellar deficit. A commercial exercise-based treatment program, the DDAT, dyslexia dyspraxia attention deficit treatment aims to remediate cerebellar difficulties. Children are, are encouraged to practice motor skills such as catching beanbags while standing on one leg on a cushion. This is claimed to benefit reading. Imaging studies could measure where neural changes occur in response to such remediation to see whether permanent changes to the neural areas of reading are involved. This seems unlikely. Any effects found for reading are probably short-term placebo effects. Number and dyscalculia. <laughs> Progress in understanding the underpinnings of arithmetic has been rapid since the proposal that the human brain has dedicated circuits for recognizing numeracy. This number sense capacity depends on parietal, prefrontal, and, and cingulate areas with the horizontal segment of the bilateral intraparietal sulcus, or hips playing a central part in the basic representation and manipulation of quantity. In simple paradigms, in which participants have to decide whether, for example, 3 is larger than 5, the hips might be the only region specifically engaged. Activity in the hips is modulated by the semantic distance between numbers and by the size of numbers. Other arithmetic operations are more dependent on language-based fact retrieval, such as simple multiplication, which activates the angular gyrus. Some arithmetic operations depend on the mental number line. This is an apparently universal mental spatial representation of number, in which smaller numbers are represented on the left side of space, and larger numbers are presented on the right. The interactions revealed between number and space in the parietal cortex have been particularly interesting. Manual responses to large numbers are faster when the response is on the right side of space, and vice versa for smaller numbers. In line, in line bisection tasks in which participants have, have to estimate the central point of a horizontal line, midpoint estimation systematically deviates to the left if the line is made up of twos, and to the right if the line is made up of nines. Interesting. 
The numbers automatically bias attention. Patients with visual neglect, a disorder of spatial attention following right parietal damage, um, systematically neglect the left side of space. These patients show a rightward bias in line bisection tasks. The rightward bias was even found for oral estimation. For example, when asked to state the numerical midpoint of 2 and 6, patients tended to give answers like 5. Therefore, numerical manipulations seem to depend crucially on intact spatial representations. Indeed, blind adults who acquire numbers spatially show normal parietal distance effects. So far, findings from adult neuroimaging and neuropsychological studies, studies remain to be applied to understanding mathematical development in children. One important, uh, one important electroencephalograph, electroencephalograph study showed that when five-year-old children perform the number comparison task is four larger or smaller than five, they show effects at similar electrodes in the parietal cortex as adults with similar latencies. However, reaction time data showed that the children were three times slower to organize the key press response. This imaging experiment raises the possibility that, neurally, young children can extract numerical information as fast as adults. The slow acquisition of calculation skills in the primary years might, therefore, reflect difficulties in understanding arithmetic notions and place value, rather than difficulties in understanding the relationship between digits and quantities. Neuroimaging studies can help us to investigate this possibility. Also of interest to teachers is the evidence for the spatial mental number line. At present, there are various models in schools for teaching children ordinal knowledge of number, that numbers come in an ordered scale of magnitude. The finding that the brain has a preferred mode of representation suggests that teachers should build on this spatial system when teaching ordinality and place value. For example, through teaching tools such as the empty number line. Developmental dyscalculia occurs when a child experiences unexpected difficulty in learning arithmetic in the absence of mental retardation, despite adequate schooling and social environment. One possible neural explanation is that the core quantity system in the hips has developed abnormally. This possibility was investigated by a functional MRI study of girls with Turner syndrome, who typically present with visuospatial and number processing deficits. Sulcal morphometry, using new techniques, uh, revealed that the right intraparietal sulcal pattern of most patients with Turner syndrome showed, ab showed aberrant branching, abnormal interruption, and or usual, unusual orientation. It was suggested that this anatomical disorganization could explain the visual, spatial, and arithmetic impairments found behaviorally. A number of very low birth weight children with arith arithmetical... Oh, one second, I'm getting a call. Okay, I'm back. It was suggested that this anatomical disorganization could explain the visual, spatial, and arithmetic impairments found behaviorally. A study of very low birth weight children with arithmetical difficulties found reduced gray matter in the left intraparietal sulcus. Control studies are now required to determine whether the parietal sulci are abnormal in other developmental syndromes that do not present with arithmetical difficulties. If parietal abnormalities characterize only children presenting with arithmetical impairments, this would imply a direct link between the brain and behavior. Children without apparent developmental syndromes who present with unusually poor number processing in the classroom would then need to be assessed for parietal damage. Attention, emotion, and social cognition. The short attention spans of some children pose continual problems for their teachers. Children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, are particularly... Boy, 
There was a bug on my glasses. Are particularly challenging to educate as they are inattentive and impulsive, cruising the classroom instead of focusing on their work. Of course, all young children experience some difficulties in sustaining attention and inhibiting impulses. Perhaps attentional training might benefit all preschoolers, leading to educational advantages. A recent brain imaging study claimed that five days of attention training significantly improved performance on tests of intelligence in four and six-year-old children. The children were given training exercises to improve stimulus discrimination, anticipation, and conflict resolution. For example, they learned to track a cartoon cat on a computer screen by using a joystick to anticipate the movement of a duck across a pond by moving the cat to where the duck should emerge, and to select the larger of two arrays of digits when co conflict was introduced by using smaller digits to present the larger array. Attention was tested before and after the training exercises by asking children to press a computer key to indicate which direction the central fish in a row of five fish was facing. Before training, the children were also given an intelligence test, and the same test was repeated after five days of training, which in itself would improve performance due to item familiarity. Children in the control group either received the attention and, and intelligence tests only or attended the laboratory for five sessions of watching popular videos. No matched computer training with animal cartoons was provided to train a control skill, such as memory. Even so, attention training did not improve performance in attention. Instead, an effect of, of attention training was found for one of the intelligence tests. Scores on the matrices su uh, subtest improved by a significant 6.5 points for the trained four-year-olds only. EEG data, electroencephalography data, electroencephalograph data were then collected to determine whether neural conflict-related attentional effects familiar from adults would be found in the trained children. The effect sought with the larger frontal negativity for incongruent trials at the frontoparietal electrodes, particularly at CZ, despite the lack of behavioral effects, an electrophysiological effect was found for the trained six-year-olds at the target electrode, CZ. For the trained four-year-olds, a hint of an effect was found at a different frontal electrode, FZ. From these single electrode results, it was argued that the executive attention network can be influenced by educational interventions during development. However, as the attention intervention did not affect the children's performance in the attention tasks, further research is needed to support this conclusion. Unusually, the authors offer their training program free through the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, enabling other scientists to test its effectiveness. This is to be highly commended. So, the electrophysiological recordings of activity during number processing tasks in children and adults, figure one, or figure two, and that is A, which is this one up here. Of course, four, six, one, nine. Participants were shown numbers representing, re represented by either dots or digits and required to press a response key with their left hand if the numbers were smaller than five or with their right hand if the numbers were larger than five. In adults, the typical finding in such tests is that responses are faster when numbers are distant, for example, nine or one, rather than close, six or four to five. This is called the distance effect. Behavioral data indicated distance effects for both adults and children in this task. B, this one right here. A schematic depiction of the event-related potential ERP procedure. Recording to brain activity began 200 milliseconds before and ended 800 milliseconds after stimulus onset. Within this recording epoch, voltage changes associated with the behavioral distance effect for adults and children were found at similar uh, parietal electrode sites. 
However, the schematic shows that the key press response required uh, approximately 500 milliseconds for the adults, but approximately 1600 milliseconds for the children. Whereas numbers seem to be recognized at, sim um, at similar latencies by children and adults, organization of the required response takes much longer for children. Hmm. C. Represent representative posterior channel, 91, comparing ERPs in adults, event-related potentials in adults, and five-year-olds for the number comparison task. The x-axis is in milliseconds and corresponds to a one-second epoch of recorded ele um, electroencephalogram. Electroencephalogram encephalogram. Jeez, I'm going to get that. One second epoch of recorded electroencephalogram, uh, 200 millisecond baseline, 800 millisecond post-stimulus. Tap panel notation effects, digit, uh, digits versus dots. The two age groups show quantitatively similar initial components. Uh, P1, N1, and P2, P, with only slightly delayed peaks in the five-year-olds. Middle panel, ERP, distance effects for digits in both age groups. Bottom panel, um, ERP, distance effect for dots in both age groups. Significant differences associated with distance began in children 50 milliseconds after adults, despite children having reaction times that were... Uh, greater than 100 milliseconds longer. Ask, um, asterisk denotes significant differences at p lesser than 0.5, modified with permission from 1998 National Ec that was weird. 1998 National Academy of Sciences. Hmm. Interesting. The neural substrates for emotional processing are increasingly well understood. For example, the amygdala is known to be important for the interpretation of emotional and social signals, particularly from the face and eyes. In adults, the degree of amygdala activation is particularly correlated with the intensity of facial expressions of fear. Children, too, show amygdala activity to fearful expressions, and children with autism who have impaired social cogn cognition have significantly increased amygdala volume. The anatomical system involved in fear processing could be abnormal from an early age in autism, as was suggested by a recent EEG study with three-year-olds. The mirror neuron system in the inferior frontal gyrus is also involved in understanding the emotional states of others. The results of a recent fMRI study showed no activity in this area in children with autism when compared with typically developing children during the imitation of emotional expression. Mirror neurons appear to mediate our understanding of emotional states via imitation, allowing the translation of an observed action, such as a facial expression, into its internally felt emotional significance. This translation appeared to be absent in autism. Hmm. Research such as this allows us to study the neural underpinnings of emotional processing in children in mainstream schooling. For example, children exposed to harsh discipline and physical abuse at home seem to process emotions differently from other children. In later childhood, they are also more likely to have conduct disorders that make them difficult to teach. Such children are prone to an anger attribution bias tending to misattribute anger, misattribute anger to the actions and statements of others. So far, little neuroimaging work has been done with, e with such children. If atypical brain development is found, and if training programs can be devised to improve these children's reading of social signals, this would be of benefit to education. 
We already know that it might be possible to teach children with autism to read emotions to some degree. Optimal interventions for other groups of children could also be designed with imaging data helping to pinpoint the brain networks to be targeted. A similar logic applies to learning anxiety. Neuroimaging studies of anxiety disorders in adults focus particularly on structural and functional changes in the orbitofrontal cortex and the temporal lobes, including the amygdala. Anxiety disorders are known to increase following traumatic brain injury. A, neuro, uh, a neuroimaging study of children aged 4 to 19 years with severe traumatic brain injury showed that children with more damage to the orbitofrontal cortex were less likely to develop anxiety disorders. The authors suggested that an imbalance in the orbitofrontal cortex amygdala connection could influence the expression of anxiety and pinpointed and pointed out that in non-human primates these connections begin to develop during gestation. Anxiety disorders can be treated and neuroimaging in adults suggests that some beneficial treatments target the amygdala. As in adults, anxiety in children appears to affect attentional systems, leading children to selectively shift attention towards threatening stimuli. Again, it might be possible to devise early interventions for such children and to use neuroimaging to identify who is most likely to benefit. Can we bridge the gulf? While we await such developments, can we bridge the gulf between neuroscience and education by speaking directly to teachers and sidestepping the middlemen of the brain-based learning industry? We're trying to do this in our UK seminar series and through the International Mind, Brain, and Education Society. For example, at the Cambridge Conference, prominent neuroscientists working in areas such as literacy, numeracy, IQ, learning, social cognition, and ADHD spoke directly to teachers about the scientific evidence being gathered in scientists' lab uh, laboratories. I almost said laboratories. The teachers were amazed at how little was, shown, was known, although there was enthusiasm for and appreciation of for getting first-hand information. This was coupled with frustration at hearing that many of the brain-based programs currently in schools had no scientific basis. The frustration arose because the neuroscientists were not telling the teachers what works instead. One delegate said that the conference, quote, left teachers feeling that they had lost lots stripped away from them and nothing put in its place, end quote. Another commented that, quote, class teachers will take on new initiatives if they are sold on the benefits for the children. Ultimately, this is where brains live, end quote. This last comment surely provides an insight into the success of the brain-based learning industry. Inspirational marketing ensures that teachers who attend these conferences do get sold on the supposed benefits of these programs for the children that they teach. Owing to, to placebo effects, these programs may indeed bring benefits to children in the short term. However, such programs are unlikely to yield benefits in the long term, and so many will naturally fall out of use. One teacher commented, quote, we no longer make children wear their VAK badges, end quote. The question for society is, should neuroscientists do anything about this misuse of science? After all, each of these programs will have a natural life and will go away. Only findings for the classroom that are really based on neuroscience will endure. So should we do, should we do anything now? At least two lessons for science and society have emerged from efforts to bring together neuroscience and education. The first is the immense goodwill that teachers and educators have for neuroscience. They are very interested in neuroscience. They feel that we have the potential to make important discoveries about human learning, and they are eager to learn about these discoveries and to contribute ideas and suggestions. Many teachers have found it attending these conferences and in an intellectually exhilarating experience. The second lesson is that neuroscientists may not be those best placed to communicate with the teachers in any sustained way, which is 
quite possibly true. The scientists are seen as too concerned to establish the rigor of their ex uh, experimental manipulations and as providing too much data. Most teachers prefer broad brush messages with a big picture and being told what works. Neuroscientists are not necessarily gifted at communicating with society at large, and they are appropriately cautious about saying that something works. At least true neuroscientists are. It may be of most use to society if we, as scientists, foster and support a network of communicators of our research. Individuals who can bring the current gulf between neuroscience and education by providing high quality knowledge in a, in a digestible form. These communicators could function in a similar way to the information officers of medical charities. But in this case, explain what neuroscience breakthroughs mean for the child in the classroom. Ideal communicators would be ex-scientists with an interest in education, perhaps attached to universities or to national education departments. They could fulfill a dual role, interpreting neuroscience from the perspective of and in the language of educators, and feeding back research questions and ideas from educators to neuroscientists. In my view, we should not remain quiet when claims that we know to, uh, to be spurious are made, such as that children can organize themselves for reading and writing by pressing their brain buttons. Nevertheless, it might be ultimately, uh, it might ultimately be of most value to society if we empower our own middlemen, communicators who know who to consult for expert advice on the latest claims of the brain-based learning industry and who are clearly working in the public interest and not for profit. A network of such communicators would serve us all and our children and would prevent society from pouring precious educational resources into scientifically spurious application. That's not gonna happen. Yeah, let's get our most intelligent, most dedicated people who have, who have let's say, uh, they have retired from the scientific industry and maybe they're teaching or doing something now and let's have them increase their, their workload exponentially without paying them more. That's a, me that's a recipe for disaster, I'll tell you that. Plus, these, these are going to be people who are retired, which means anything any data that they're going to be giving you or any particular pet theories that they have are going to be like 50 years old or so. That's also not going to work. Always interesting when scientists come up with um, these sorts of logical solutions to these problems, but they're human solutions. And because humans are inherently selfish and self-centered and hardly ever altruistic for a sustained period of time, um, it just it just doesn't work. It's funny because neuroscientists don't really understand a lot about fundamental human behavior in many instances. Perhaps we can get the evolutionary psychologists on, on this task or something, or the behaviorists, but neuroscientists might not be the best option. <laughs> but this is interesting. One thing, let's see, some of the things that I learned from this paper is that, of course, neuroscience and teaching need to be connected in an appropriate way. But oftentimes what we do is there will be this study that seems to indicate one thing or another. Then we oversell that study to such a high degree that it becomes sort of like a pop culture neuroscientific truth or truism. But it could be completely wrong or we could be, we could be putting way too much weight on one particular study when it's not merited. 
And so we need to be careful with that. And the teachers, especially when they teach children, need to be careful of that because, you know, they're bringing up the next generation in, in knowledge oftentimes, and they're instilling in children the uh, values and the the uh, pathological theories that we might have, and so they need to be particularly careful. But I don't have much faith in, in primary education at this point, unfortunately. But we'll see. Maybe someday that'll change. 55 minutes. It's not bad. I hope you guys enjoyed this paper, and uh, let me know what you think. Have a good day. Bye.